Hi everyone, I'm Lucy from So Essential and I'm here today with a Q&A session for you. So I'll be answering lots of sewing questions. Thank you to everybody who's taken part. If you've got a question you'd like me to answer, do pop it in the comments below. And if you like what you see today, please like and subscribe because every Friday I bring you a video packed full of sewing goodness. And then if you can't quite make it from one week to the next, if you'd like some more content, we've got a great Instagram account as well where I share details of what I'm making, I share close-up shots, sewing tips and advice, so get on and have a look at that as well, I've popped the link to that below. So let's get started with the questions, I'm afraid I haven't got everybody's name on the questions so I do apologise if I've missed your name but you, I've included all the questions that I've had from various different sources. So um, the first one is a lady who said she's lucky enough to have a sewing room, a dedicated sewing room. Oh my goodness, I would love that. Um, but she said she's just trying to work out what the best layout is for it in terms of the tools, um, apart from her sewing machine and overlocker. So yeah, I can imagine I would be the same. I think it's a you know, lovely thing to have, but could be a little bit overwhelming trying to work out how to set everything up. And I've got lots of thoughts and ideas here for you. So so I think the first thing to think about is where's the natural light and making sure that you're making best use of that. You know, you probably want your sewing machine and your overlocker nearest to any natural light. If you haven't got much natural light in the room though, do bear in mind that we do daylight um, lamps which are excellent um, for creating that daylight artificially. So I'll pop a link to those below for you, it might be worth having a look at those. The other thing to think about is the furniture you're going to use. It's a good idea to get some furniture that you can add to at a later date if you want to because whether we like it or not for a lot of us those craft supplies just keep expanding and get bit getting bigger and bigger i know a lot of people really like the ikea furniture we've used that at home for other things as well um it's got you know it's great for sort of mixing and matching and lots of the shelving units are perfect for things like sewing rooms because you can Put a basket in there um, or a box and you could keep your fabric in there for example and I know a lot of people use those for that um, but in terms of you know the rest of the tools I think the most important thing to think about is what are the tools that you're constantly reaching for and that you need close to hand and I've had to think about this a lot because I haven't got a dedicated sewing room so I've got a I use the dining room so I have to think about what are those things I want to keep reaching out for and getting so the scissors and measuring tools, bobbins, pins and needles, rulers, tailor's chalk and marking pens, and then threads were probably the most important things for me. Now, what you can do to have those sort of close at hand, one of the ideas that a lot of people use these days is to have one of these pegboards like the one behind me. Now, you can buy these purpose-made. Um, they are quite expensive, the ones that I found, but we actually, my husband actually made this for me. So we just went to a local timber merchant's. Um, I got the, they do this uh, sort of pegboard, um, I think it's MDF, they do sheets of that, so I bought a sheet of that and then I bought some architrave and my husband just created the frame for me um, and then you can buy the wooden pegs and that works really really well and then you can use that to store a lot of the tools that I've just talked about. You can put wooden pegs in and hang your scissors off them for example or your tape measures and that sort of thing but the other thing you can do is you can get little um, metal buckets or little tubs and hang those up as well. You can even add a shelf on there as well to, to put things so just make a list of all those things that you think you're going to be reaching for all the time and you can store them on there. The other thing that you can use as well is those magnetic knife strips that you can get from Ikea. So they're designed for in the kitchen to stick your knives to but you can use those for lots of the metal tools um, that you might use in your sewing room as well. So lots of ideas there. Um, also you might want to, you, you're going to want to think about the fact that you're going to need somewhere to press, somewhere to cut out and somewhere to sew and in an ideal world you'd be able to move between those areas nice and easily 
but if you haven't got a particularly large area for uh, pressing you might want to consider getting one of these mini sleeve ironing boards or a mini and or a mini iron as well we do these um, by prim and they can be quite useful if you don't want to be getting a full size ironing board out all the time obviously sometimes you're going to need that it's going to be necessary as is your full sized iron but those things can just be useful if you haven't got the biggest space um, in terms of your bobbin storage as well I just thought I'd show you these little handy bobbin boxes I think these are great um, because the key is really it's keeping things neat and tidy and organised so that when you come to sew you can just get straight on with it and you're not scrabbling around <laughs> looking everywhere for things so some of these sorts of storage solutions can be really useful as well we've got absolutely loads on the website so do get on and have a look the other um, thing is you can do what I've done here with the thread rack and keep your threads on a thread rack and mount that onto the pegboard if you've got one. But the other thing I do at home, um, because I, I've got, I use the dining room and I've got a sideboard with drawers, um, and you could do this in a sewing room as well. If you've got drawers that you want to store your thread in, we do do thread boxes like this, and I've got all my threads organised in one of these. We do them for overlocker threads and for sewing machine threads as well, and that just helps keep things really neat and tidy. I'm, I'm, I've sort of gone a bit, you know, over the top with it, and I've even organised it in colour order as well. It's like a nice rainbow, but it just means it's quick and easy for me to see if I've got the right thread colour that I need. So that's really useful as well. The other thing I think it's really important to get organised with is your sewing pattern storage as well. Now I've got some of these boxes which I keep in um, a wardrobe and they're really sort of inexpensive. It's just a simple box. You can write a list on the front of the different patterns that you've got in there. Um, you can store 30 to 40 patterns in these and then there's these divider cards as well that you get with it just to, to get even more organised so you can find your patterns nice and easily. If you want something a little bit more decorative, if you're going to have them out on display, um, on bookshelves or whatever perhaps, we've got some lovely simplicity vintage ones like this one, they come in different designs and they're a really nice way to organise things. So I think as with anything in the home, um, storage is key isn't it and as long as you've got the right storage you can get organised and then things stay tidy and it's easy to find what you're looking for. The other thing to mention as well is um, a wooden floor is a good option or a, a laminate floor you know not carpet in a sewing room and that might sound really obvious but it's easy to overlook but you know with all the pins and threads and scraps of fabric it's so much easier to clean up with that hard floor surface rather than a carpet so that's something to bear in mind as well and while I'm on the subject of the thread stand somebody did ask whether you could store overlocker threads on there now the big cones like this Gutterman um, Taldy lock that I've got here, they, they won't sit on there properly. I mean, you, you probably could get them to just about balance um, okay, but you know, I personally think they might be prone to falling off there because the spikes that stick out, we do sell this spool rack on our website, but the spikes that stick out aren't quite long enough. Now you could extend them, I suppose, um, but you might be better off with one of those boxes that I talked about for storing those bigger overlocker threads. Um, but it's also worth mentioning, if you did want the thread stand like this, these threads that we sell are suitable for overlockers and sewing machines. There's a thousand metres on one of these reels. Um, they're a great quality thread and I use them all the time on my machine and on my overlocker and they come in a lovely range of colours. So you might want to look at investing in those and using those um, in future instead. I'll put a link to those below as well. So I hope that answers the question about the sewing room. I'd love to have my own sewing room and I hope that your organisation of your new sewing room goes really well. The next question that I had was how do you shorten a shoulder seam on a princess seam dress? 
So I had a look in my trusty Palmer and Pletch complete guide to fitting book, which is my fitting Bible. I always use this if ever I need to make any adjustments. A lot of the adjustments that I make are standard on all of my makes. I learned how to do them in here. It really is a great book. It's taught me so much. Um, so I had a look at what Palmer and Pletch say, because I haven't had to make this adjustment myself. And what they suggest, is I've, I've drawn it on a piece of paper here for you. I hope that you can see that. But I've drawn the, this is the bodice piece, obviously with the princess seam. And Palmer and Pletch just suggest just tapering that armhole in slightly there and that reduces the length of the shoulder seam. So you would obviously need to do that on the back piece as well. And what I would always recommend is, you know, do twirl it, do do a very basic twirl. A twirl doesn't have to be absolutely perfect and exactly the same, you know, just look at the bits you need to understand and you need to work on and use those and create a twirl and see, see how it works for you. We had another question as well from Maureen Cullen who asked, I have a Janome CXL301 which does automatic buttonholes. How do I make a buttonhole if the button is too large to fit in the buttonhole foot? So the buttonhole foot will only go up to one inch. Um, and, you know, and there may be times when you want to use a bigger button than that on a coat perhaps, or um, you might want to create some sort of really wide, um, uh, buttonholes to thread something through the waist of something so this was a real head scratcher for me because I just could not find the information anywhere and we didn't know um, what the answer was but I spoke to our Janome rep and she told me that this trick will work for any Janome machine so if any of you have got a Janome machine and it's really stumpy well how on earth do I do a buttonhole bigger than one inch if I need to what she explained to me was you just need to set the machine for a buttonhole in the normal way, use your satin stitch or zigzag foot and then pull the buttonhole lever down as you would do with the normal buttonhole foot. And she said, if you think about it, all that happens with that buttonhole foot is it knocks the lever when it gets to the right point so that the machine then knows to sew the next step of the buttonhole. So she said, all you have to do is make sure you've marked your buttonhole on your fabric. And when you get to the end of that first line of stitches, manually with your finger, tap the buttonhole lever and then the machine will sew the bar tack and then when you finish sewing that tap the lever again and it will allow you to sew the final long row of stitches and then tap it again and you'll do the final bar tack so you're just manually telling the machine what to do rather than the buttonhole foot doing that so that was a real revelation to me and I thought wow this could be so helpful to so many people with Janome machines so thanks for asking that question Maureen I hope that helps you and I hope it helps lots of other people too. Um, Elaine Elam asked if I knew of any rugby shirt or polo shirt sewing patterns and I'm really sorry Elaine I did I knew we had a couple because I remembered featuring them um, when the sewing bee was on fairly recently and they were Jarley 3137 and Vogue 9378 however it looks like those patterns have been discontinued now um, but I thought you know you might be able to find a copy on eBay somewhere you know at least if I could give you the numbers you might be able to come across one somewhere um, but we don't we don't have those patterns patterns unfortunately anymore so I'm really sorry about that. Um, now the other question that I wanted to cover was Cecilia asked some time ago whether um, how I made the adjustments to my Tilly and the Buttons Nora t-shirt that I made. So the Nora top is a really oversized baggy t-shirt and jumper top. Uh, jumper pattern and I made it I made it in the original oversized version um, as a turtleneck and then I wanted to make like a nice loose fitting t-shirt version but I didn't want it to be as oversized on the pattern so I, I made the bodice narrower I made it narrower by quite a long way so Cecilia asked how I did that so I've got a little demonstration here again this is the Nora top pattern bodice piece the front bodice piece and what I did 
was I simply cut down that line there that I've drawn. So I drew a line from midway across the shoulder seam down to the hem and I just slashed the pattern piece there. If you're not confident about making alterations, you can always trace the pattern first and, and test it out and see how you get on. But then I overlapped the pattern pieces and then I trued the shoulder seam. So what I would have done is stuck that together with tape and then I would have drawn a line from the neckline tapering down to where the new shoulder seam was and smoothed that and trued that so it was all level and that created my narrower bodice pieces so I'd have to do the same on the back as well but the beauty of doing it that way is you know the armhole hasn't been affected the neckline hasn't been affected but I've ma managed to narrow that bodice piece and just take some of that fullness out and I did the same on the back as well um, so that everything matched up so I hope that answers that question for you Cecilia and then the next question I got asked was um, somebody um, called Guernsey Girl, I think it is on Instagram. Um, she asked, do I twirl all of my makes? Well, the answer is no, I don't, definitely not. I mean, you know, I suppose just from the experience that I've got and the wide range of patterns I've tried and the wide range of brands I've tried, I've got I've usually got a sense I usually know what size I'll be in a certain brand or um, you know how well certain brands fit me if there's any sort of problem areas that you know I'll need to think about but if there's a pattern where it's going to be a really intricate detailed make it's going to take a long time say like a tailored shirt or a pair of jeans these ginger jeans um you know I might want to then do a twirl I didn't with the jeans actually thinking about it because I was quite confident in that pattern because I knew people had raved about it but yeah if it was like a tailored shirt or something like that I might think well I'll just take the time to make a basic twirl because then I've got the confidence that you know it's going to fit if I go to all the trouble of doing a stand-up collar and cuff plackets and all the rest of it um, but for the majority of makes you know I, do, I don't have to make a twirl because I'll know um, I'll know because I've tried those patterns before and I'll know sort of how well they fit me but what I will say is when I do make twirls um, you know I, I make very very basic twirls a lot of the time because a lot of the time you just need to be able to see you know are things in the correct place you know um, is the fit good of the basic bodice you know you don't need to do all the other aspects now I know professionals would tell you you absolutely should make the whole thing um, but you know it depends what you want to achieve from your sewing and for me as a home sewer you know I am more than happy just to create a very basic twirl of those things that I'm a little bit uncertain about um, and just want to make sure that the basic fits good and then also you know as long as that basic fits good I think you can always make tweaks and alterations as you go along as well you know you can always play with your seam allowances a little bit it's not you know the proper way to do things but that's how I like to do mine and I did put a post on Instagram a while ago as well about the stages that I go through with fitting a garment so yeah that might be interesting to you as well um Diane asked Diana Irvin asked have I made a long denim skirt um I haven't made a long denim skirt Diane but I did make Berda 6252 which was a lovely button down a-line skirt and I made that in the short version and there's I was really pleased with it I thought it was a great pattern really enjoyed making it and I wear it a lot but there was also a long version of that pattern as well so I thought you could try that so I'll pop a link to um the pattern below and there's also a video somewhere on our YouTube channel where I show that skirt as well so I'll see if I can find the link for that for you as well so I hope that helps and then finally Katie asked how do you finish a neckline and armhole sewing with scuba so um, the, uh, the example I could think of was I made Simplicity 8330 which is like a really fitted princess seamed 
high necked um, evening dress. I made that in scuba a few years ago now. It's actually a, a pattern for woven fabric, so I had to size down quite dramatically. It's a really interesting project, so I'll put a link to the blog post below so you can, you know, read about it. But also, I did put some um, quite intricate details about how I finish the armholes because um, I think because it was a woven pattern they'd suggested lining it but because it was scuba I thought I don't really want to line it and add extra weight um, to the fabric and it was a dress for summer as well it was quite fitted so what I did was I created my own little bias um, binding just to finish the armholes so I cut strips of fabric in the direction with the most stretch um, and I cut them one and a quarter inches wide and then I think I stitched them down with a 3 8 seam allowance um, and then pressed them into place and I think I top stitched or uh, stitched in the ditch to secure them and that worked really well. As I say, I'll pop a link to the blog post where the, all the details are so you can see a bit more closely and read you know, the full details on it. Um, and then the neckline was finished with a with a neckband luckily but if you had a pattern where it didn't have a neckband um, it had like a collar sort of neckband on that dress um, I think you could use the bias binding again or perhaps you could use uh, create a facing and use like a slightly lighter weight stretch fabric um, for the facing but um, you know my my preference really would probably be to create the bias binding so yeah but again always just test out on scraps of fabric have a go see how you get on so I hope everybody's enjoyed that today thank you so much to everybody who took part it's an absolute pleasure chatting sewing to you and answering your questions so please do leave your questions in the comments below so I can answer them next time if you like what you see today please like and subscribe and I'll look forward to seeing you next time